Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with embodiment specialists from around the world. I'm your host, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Justin Mastin. So Justin looks like the most fun person ever in yoga, which might not be saying a lot, but I still think she's going to be cool. (laughs) She's also a trained therapist. She's got a book published. She's come recommended to me as someone that's going to be good fun and actually does some really interesting work. So Justin, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So creator of creator and fearless leader of Yoga Quest. Yes. That's your official title. That's my official title. I'm, I'm bought in already. I want to do it already. Like straight out of the bag. I'm like, I'm, where do I sign up? Mm-hmm. Um, so let's start at the beginning. How did you get interested in the body? What was your route into all this stuff? Oh, okay. So that goes way back. Um, I was a dancer to start. I started when I was four or five. Um, I did what I call the suburban trifecta, which is tap, ballet, and jazz. Uh, <laughs> and, and I did that for... Um, just about until I finished high school, I guess. Um, and I, I experimented with yoga. I was yoga curious. Um, I went with my mom in the eighties and it just, it wasn't for me at the time. I, you know, I was a dancer and for me, yoga felt like, Oh, this is too slow. We're not on the beat. Like this is, you know, this isn't what I want. Um, and I came back to yoga in, uh, my undergraduate studies at university, and it was for a, a credit, a physical education credit, and so that wasn't so hot either. Um, so when I really started to appreciate yoga was in the early 2000s when one of the big box yoga franchises opened here in Minneapolis, and I discovered hot yoga. And I, my practice looks a lot different now, but at the time, that really spoke to me. Nice. Okay. So, so now this is where I, I just want to dive into the interesting stuff really with, with you do this cool thing called yoga quest. Mm-hmm. And I was first aware of this. I was on, I think it was yoga journal and they have videos on there and I'm scrolling through and it's like, okay, skinny girl doing vinyasa. Okay. I'll go with a beard. Okay. And then <laughs> girl with in a star Trek uniform, uh-huh. Which works for me on a number of levels, but the, 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 I was just immediately like, what the fuck is this? This looks really cool and different. So mm-hmm. tell us what the fuck it is. Yeah. Um, so I, I love that question. What the fuck it is, is uh, what I've done is I've linked together movement with narratives. I mean, mm. that's, that is the, the easiest explanation. That's but, such a posh way of talking about what you do. Okay. Right. Continue, continue. Oh, right. Right. That's like the... That's how I tell people that don't get it. I'm like, I... Grown-ups. That's how you tell grown-ups. Right. Look, I, linked, <laughs> I linked together movement with narratives for a truly unique and powerful experience. Um, but so those I, narratives, though, are like geek narratives, right? Yeah. Um, so just the tiniest bit of history, and I hope this isn't too boring, um, but about eight years ago, I was at a Comic-Con, and I was... already what that is, the non Oh, yes. You might not know uh, what that is. Thank you. Uh, So a comic con or a comic convention is a gathering of nerds who get together to talk about nerd stuff. (laughs) Got it. (laughs) And um, I was kind of looking around and noticing that there weren't any conversations around wellness. And I was already a yoga teacher at the time. And I, I was thinking like, why why aren't we telling geeks that they're important, meaningful human beings? Like, why, are, why is the only narrative around geek, quote unquote, wellness that, you know, you, you guys need to lose weight and get out of your parents' basement and put down the Mountain Dew? Like, I... Yeah. Uh, so, so, for, so Man and G's a soft drink, right? Like, that's like a cola kind of thing. Like, <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, we don't have it anymore. <laughs> You Americans know nothing about the rest of the world. Listen, that's not so, true. So, 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 Mountain Dew is, they may have another country. They don't really have <laughs> Cheerio. <laughs> we don't have Cheerios. <laughs> we don't have those. We have Frosties. Um, so, here's the thing I was into board games a little bit. 
And my yeah. cousin, no, two cousins are like super geeky. They do the whole dressing up as superheroes and going to these mm-hmm. conventions. Yeah. It all just looks tremendously fun. I've never looked down on it. It look, just looks like a really wholesome, fun, good time. Mm-hmm. But also it does look like in those communities, there are quite a lot of people who aren't so well physically like there's been this traditional, particularly maybe in American high schools and things between the sort of athletic ones. And then if you're not in the sort of healthy athletic group, then sort of the geek subculture is another one you can kind of get into. Mm -hmm. That's been at least a stereotype into this point. There there seems to be some truth in that those subcultures aren't always that uh, physically well. Is is that just a cliche or do you think there's some truth in that? Well, I think that like all stereotypes, it comes from a place of truth. Mm. And I say that um, knowing that the conversation really is changing. Um, But when I was coming up, there was just, there was no conversation around how to be well and be a nerd. Like that just, that wasn't a thing. So there was no conversation around it. If you wanted to be quote unquote well, then I mean, I guess you can't engage in these activities that are really meaningful to you. Yeah. And that's, that's really how Yoga Quest came into being because I thought, wait a minute, how, how come we're not telling these folks they can give a shit about themselves yeah. while still caring about what they care about? Yeah. And, and so I, I made a commitment to myself at that Comic Con yeah, that I was fantastic. gonna find. I was gonna find a way to make yoga not just accessible, but like really fucking fun for geeks. So here's the thing: people don't say about accessibility. They think maybe it's about ethnicity or body weight, and of course that's important. Mm-hmm. Also, masses of people that would never go into a yoga class uh, or a martial arts class or whatever, perhaps because they feel their subculture that they identify strongly with doesn't fit. Like my wife's mm-hmm. a goth. You know, mm. goth mm-hmm. is not going to go to the average yoga class. And there's something, that there's, there's an inaccessibility in terms of uh, the kind of shininess or the sort of normal normality around, around a lot of practices, particularly yoga. I noticed the geeks quite like martial arts quite a lot, particularly certain martial arts like Aikido and Ninjutsu. Um, oh, they, uh, they love Klingon bat left. <laughs> That's <laughs> <laughs> so a bat left is a Klingon uh, t- kind of a double-handed sword, curved blade type thing. I know my Star Trek. I love this commentary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just aware that the audience are really international and have such different backgrounds. Okay, so so your narratives, as you call them, when you say narrative, it's mm-hmm. not like Dostoevsky, right? It's like Harry Potter, <laughs> Star Trek, Star Wars. I mean, that's the kind of narrative that you're you're talking about here. Right, right, and um. So I do a few different types of classes, but when we're talking about kind of the flagship yoga quest class, we're talking about a class that is literally narrated. So what we do is um, I take something beloved from pop culture. Let's, let's use Star Trek, the original series, because we're already, yeah. we already seem to be on a Star Trek bent. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> and I'll write up a fan fiction adaptation of an episode or a couple episodes or a movie. It's kind of like the, do you guys have Cliff's Notes? Uh, is that like uh, like the short version? Yeah, like an abridged version uh-huh. uh, c- with my snark and commentary in there as well. And then I assign yoga poses to certain words, actions, objects in the script I've created. Then someone literally reads the script. Yeah. They emphasize words that have poses assigned to them. And the students follow along like uh, Simon says, or a drinking game. Oh, that's fantastic. So you do like warrior pose at a certain point in the narrative where there was like a fight. Mm-hmm. And, like, give me some examples. Like I love Captain Kirk because I'm also uh, an irresponsible womanizer in charge of something I probably shouldn't be in charge of. I'm a Kirk too. You're a Kirk too. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, that's, that's, is like an archetype for me. So like, you know, is there like a Kirk punch or is it a so Kirk, yoga uh, pose? Oh, you, you will, you will appreciate this once you hear it. So Kirk is a chair pose because he's sitting in his captain's chair Got it. and you're gesticulating wildly with your hands as if you're giving a monologue. Okay. And give me another pose. Give me another one from Star Trek. Let's just roll with that. Oh, maybe yep, yep. Harry, Potter. So, Harry Potter as well. So Spock um, is 
a horse pose. Some people call it goddess pose where you take a, a wide legged stance and bend your knees. And yeah. then we do a live long and prosper mudra with our hands. Got it. Got uh, it. With, with and Right. And then bones is a forward fold. That's the character or that's the pose reserved for the character that's most put upon in my stories. So <laughs> so fold- it's a sort of surrendering, giving up kind of, yep. oh God, kind of is a letting go in that, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and you make this sound. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I have this system called embodied yoga principles where we look at the sort of psychological aspects of different poses. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So it fit quite fun with this actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm normally making them cry rather than laugh, but there's a, there's a, you know, similar things and that certain poses almost have certain personalities we could say, right? Like yeah, that's absolutely. Sort of letting go like, Oh God, the, the groan is, is a, a much more what I'd call a yin forward bend and it's less likely to be associated with say a back bend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. And actually that's something I talk about in my work too, is, you know, people ask me, how do you do this? I'm like, well, I go by archetypes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're using, Jungian model, basically. Yep, exactly. I love that we're both irresponsible geeks and also <laughs> be involved in in-depth psychological work. It shouldn't work, but it does. It shouldn't work. Okay, what about Harry Potter one? Though I would, I'm just going to claim cultural appropriation uh, for the uh, <laughs> Britishness of this that you've taken on so rudely. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, but what would be a Harry Potter one? Here's this. I, I would argue that this is cultural appreciation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll let you. I'll let you. On behalf of my people, I'm handing okay. over Harry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so Harry Potter, Hermione, because she's a badass, she gets warrior too. Uh-huh. And um, Harry is a star pose. You're literally just, you know, making a star with your body and looking out to the distance as though nothing bad could ever happen to you, young Harry Potter. <laughs> does, does he die in the end? Uh, no. In the books, does he die? Uh, have you never read Harry Potter? No, I'm, I'm not 10. Oh, mm. I'm too old. <laughs> you are you're picking a fight with the wrong nerd right now. <laughs> Star Wars and Star Trek, I'll go to one. But Harry Potter, I'm just, I'm just not going to go there. I don't care how hot Hermione gets. I'm not going there. Oh. So... Okay. You're you're into depth psychology. You should be super into Harry Potter. It is well, full you know, of meaning. J.K. as I call Ms. Rowling is certainly mm-hmm. a bit of a bit of bit epic. She's certainly a cool woman. I respect and like her. Mm-hmm. But, uh, there was there was never enough sex or violence in Harry Potter for me personally. I, I you know <laughs> like I like the slightly more hardcore stuff. <laughs> Um, oh, okay, I, I, I was it. just the wrong generation as well. So most people younger than me in the UK grew up with it, and, and I know a lot of um. Uh, foreigners use it for their English teach for learning English as well. Like a lot of my Russian friends read Harry Potter because the vocabulary is pretty straightforward, you know, so I know internationally it's pretty famous. Um, okay. So we've got Harry Potter. Do you do Star Wars? Oh yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, if you are interested, start, I have a mini Star Wars quest on yoga international. So oh my God. okay. Oh my God. In that one, in that oh. one, I'm wearing an R2D2 outfit. Oh, you ruined it. I thought it was going to be princess Leia. You ruined it. <laughs> So what do I Google to find this Star Wars yoga quest, right? I must have missed this one. I was Googling Mm -hmm. before and found a few others. Uh, Star Wars Yoga Quest International, four and a half stars, so well rated. And you're in a little R2-D2 skirt. Look at that. Do you dress up for all of them or just some of them? Um, I dress up when I appear at conventions or if I'm doing a video something. Yeah. I don't tend to dress up at the studio, although every now and then I will get a bee in my bonnet and I'll show up in my R2-D2 outfit. <laughs> Got it. And that's in Minneapolis, right? Yep. Cool. So you're running a studio, you're going around doing conferences. You know, mm-hmm. the dressing up thing, like my cousins do this, they dress up as all sorts of, um, shout out to Gregory and Jordan if you ever listen to this. Um, <laughs> they have uh, geeks for the win. So they dress up as various things. And it always struck me, uh, we should crowbar in some psychology here. Um, so it always struck me as a sort of wonderful way to shift embodiment that is underrated mm-hmm. by more serious practitioners. Because for me, when I dress as a medieval knight or if I dress as a Star Wars alien or something, there's an immediate shift in my being that I, th- I think clothes and dressing up can actually open up being in the same way as little children dress up to kind of you know pretend to be a doctor or a fireman or whatever. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's actually quite healthy, I think. 
Yeah, it's incredibly healthy. And I think it's so misunderstood in our culture. There's this stigma around it. And something that I try and let other therapists know is geek is a culture that has its own norms. And there is nothing pathological about somebody dressing up as their favorite character and even embodying that character for an hour a day, a weekend of a convention. Yeah. Because it allows them to play, which is something adults in Western culture are just fucking desperate for. It enables people to expand their range, to play, to have some freedom in that. You know, everyone loves Halloween for that. You know, in, in England, it's right. just you dress up in Halloween. But in America, mm-hmm. I know it's a much bigger thing. More people dress up. You know, people like that dressing up, don't they? And, and it's, mm-hmm. it's something called the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, oh, yeah. Do you know Rocky Horror? Everyone dresses up as, as kind of hookers and stuff for that. And, uh, you know, uh, monsters of various kinds. And, they, and, and, and they, they dress up and, and people pretend that it's just for the show. But you can see and in Brighton, we have the zombie walk where everyone dresses up as zombies, mm. walks through the town. That's a popular event where I live. Mm-hmm. And um, it just seems that it brings out something in people, like a, a playful sense or expanding their limited embodiment. Like you're, people can get quite stuck in their life, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I truly believe that if we as a culture gave each other more permission to be playful, to be whimsical, that I would have fewer clients. Okay. So let's not do that. Let's keep you in business. <laughs> it's important though, isn't it? It's important that people have that. And you sometimes see it with people like the sexual domain is the only place they can be playful, which is a bit of pressure there. Or like with their kids, you know, people have kids right. and all of a sudden they rediscover this. Or in some cases, quite sad. I've you know, I think of one guy I know who just can't play with his kids. He doesn't know how to do it. He's just lost that play, you know, being a serious grown-up. Right, because it's, it's beaten out of you, metaphorically, hopefully, uh, when you reach a certain age. And I, I think that we need to start reintroducing the joy of play for all ages. And that's um, coming back to Yoga Quest people ask me all the time, like, oh, you work with kids? That's so cool. And I'm like, I don't work with the kids. No, no, great ups. No, yeah, not that I'm going to kick a kid out of class, but kids have all the permission in the fucking world to play yeah. whenever they want yeah. to. Spoiled bastards. Is the- <laughs> so, so what about this accusation that gets aimed at my cousins or myself when I play board games, for example, or whatever, is like, well, that's childish. Like what, mm-hmm. what, what do you, do you, you know, let me play devil's advocate here. Cause on the one hand, I'm fully with you on the play. I'm fully with you on, you know, it's okay to dress up, whatever, but mm-hmm. there is something that's almost like denying the mainstream world or another thing I've seen is a sort of compensatory mechanism where people are being the king in a world, a fantasy world, cause they can't get to do it in real life. So mm-hmm. what do you think of those two? Um, you know, I'm mostly playing devil's advocate here, the accusation of childlessness and the accusation of sort of compensatory function, I guess they call it in psychology. Yeah. So um, I'll talk, I'll speak to childishness first, Mm. to which I would say, yes, absolutely. That's what this is. Yeah. And isn't that wonderful? Yeah. That, That we get to be childish and playful and engage that part of ourselves because it's a really important part of ourselves. Psychology yeah. keeps showing that we need play, that we don't stop being imaginative, creative, playful creatures when we reach 22 years old. Like we need to keep up that creativity and whimsy and magic in our lives forever. Is there so, a difference between childish and childlike though? Because I, I kind of feel like. I know most of the sort of liberal left sort of idealizes children, but actually children are a fucking nightmare. They can't self-regulate. I mean, they're also wonderful and beautiful and playful. There's all this good Mm -hmm. stuff. But I wonder if there's a sort of baby in a bathwater issue here in terms of like some of that stuff from from childhood is wonderful, but some of it's Mm -hmm. also a bit of a nightmare. So, you know, for me, I use use childlike for the positive and childish for the sort of less positive sides of that. Mm. Um, in that case, I would. So, are you asking me just about Yoga Quest or geek culture in general? Let's let's go let's go in general. But I feel okay. like this actually is the shadow of a lot of embodied practices that take themselves so mm. fucking seriously. It's the like worst. when I saw your stuff, I was like, "Oh, this is so good. This is the sh- 
the shadow of yoga. Yoga needs to get the fuck over itself. Mm-hmm. And there's something about this, which is sort of actually like a shadow of all of a lot of, not just yoga, a lot of embodied practice takes itself so seriously. And there's something psychologically very healthy about having a bit of fun in there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, so generally in geek culture, I would say, yes, in, we're embracing the childlike things. I like that distinction. Um, when it comes to the childish things, I don't, really think that's quite as prevalent as yeah. people would believe yeah, that's more of a prejudice yeah yeah because i mean these these folks have money to go to these conventions they have jobs they have lives they you know they are aware that this is fantasy that they give themselves permission to yeah. engage in yeah they can hold down a job and it's you know they're they're, they're you know my cousin's a cognitive neuroscientist you know what i mean it's, oh yeah i mean but above average really IQ, what about that <laughs> what about that cliche you know there's a sort of a cliche of above average intelligence actually like i think my cousin he's a brain man he's way smarter than me mm-hmm. um what about the compensatory function then because there's this idea and it's often pointed to in a fairly unpleasant way but i think we can talk about it without being unpleasant mm-hmm. is that people do these as a compensation for the rest of their life not being that great so I, w- I would definitely challenge that. What I would say is that people get into these interests from an early age and find each other because of an otherness, an outsiderness. Yeah. And that's, that's a way to ha- build community. And I don't find that as like, oh, your life's so terrible, so you need to escape yeah. into a fantasy world. Yeah. It's I discovered this fantasy world. It's wonderful. I found these other people. They are also in this fantasy world. And I found a community because the because the rest of the world doesn't get it. And yeah. these people do. So I'm just yeah. going to put all the energy that I have into this community that gets me instead yeah. of trying to fit into this world that I don't really give a shit about. Yeah. So it's not living in the parents' basement and this is the only, you know, the only way they can be in a sort of high status kind of position is to be like a fantasy king rather than a, someone in real life who's successful. Right. And I've, I've read studies like that. I know people have done research like that. And I, I'm in my anecdotal world. Mm-hmm. And really, we don't, have enough, we don't have enough studies on the yeah. geek community to be able to say definitively. I really think people get this idea in their head and they're like, I'm going to study that because I think nerds are weird. <laughs> and I think there should be more people saying, I'm going to study that because I think nerds are cool and yeah, see yeah, yeah. if we find different results. Right? Yes, yeah, the kind of anthropological approach, which is being mm-hmm. in it and, 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 you know, actually sort of being sympathetic to it. And I actually saw one study on the martial arts community, which was saying this is compensatory for many people. And, you know, you can be this sort of fifth degree black belt, king of your own little world. And I, I do notice more geekery in martial arts that have less reality testing. So mm. it's, less, it's less geeky in, say, Thai boxing or Brazilian jiu-jitsu than, say, ninjutsu or Aikido. And I say mm. that as someone who's done 20 years of Aikido. So, that, that, so there is, I think there's maybe a little bit of something going on there in the martial arts world. Um, did, did you get any resistance from the yoga world? Like people sort of saying, this isn't yoga, yoga's spiritual, and you should be saying namaste. You know, because this could be, for me, I love the idea, by the way, but for some people, this could be almost anathema. Oh, yeah. I, I have haters. Um, anytime Yoga International posts something that I did, which uh, Kat and Kyle at Yoga International are just, I, I love them. They're wonderful and they really get what I do. Um, but, you know, they post something and uh, uh, undoubtedly somebody's going to post something that says, this is so sad. How, <laughs> how, how terrible. What is happening? This isn't yoga. And I just don't care. I mean, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> does when it I hurt first... a little bit? Because I, I have my haters too, Justine. And I think if you're part of any subculture, particularly if you have a big mouth, there's always going to be um, haters. So mm-hmm. do, do, does, it, does it sting a little bit? Sometimes it stings me a little bit. Other times I'm sort of just not caring. Sometimes it depends. It depends on what they're saying, right? Like, um, when I get the, this is so sad, she clearly doesn't, she clearly doesn't, feel uh there was there was this one that stuck in my head that was something to the effect of she clearly talking about me um that i'm clearly not emotionally invested and i was like oh hold the fucking phone (laughs) that means emotionally invested means you 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 weren't like into it i mean you look like you're really into it from what yeah they're they're 
point was because I wasn't like, you know, oming and encouraging people to call on Ganesha that I wasn't emotionally invested in my students. And I mean, which in a way is funny because normal yoga is way weirder. Like, normal, I mean, it's, think about yeah. it, like Ganesh, a fucking elephant god, or, and then, you know, poses named after imaginary sages. And, you know, I mean, already this thing's like the warrior and the child, you know, there's this element of sort of, um, or, or, or just dressing up in weird clothes and saying, om and putting on a breathy, spiritual ass Californian voice. Mm-hmm. I mean, fucking fantasy world. Like, exactly. In many ways, your stuff looks closer to, to my actual life because it's like, okay, this is 21st century, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that stings. But when people say stuff like, well, this isn't real yoga, I'm like, okay, well, it's not your yoga. And that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Because your yoga doesn't fit my students. Is and- it a mindfulness practice? Yes. So this is the only concern I had about it. And again, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate because if, if you were doing class in my town, I'd be there in the shot. Um, like one concern I had sort of looking at it was, does the narrative and the fantasy element take people out of the present moment. So if I'm thinking I'm Captain Kirk, I'm not me. If mm-hmm. I'm thinking I'm on the Starship Enterprise, I'm not actually aware of where I am so much. Like, does that distract, detract from this embodied, as, as, as yoga is an embodied practice or a mindfulness practice? Uh, okay, so yes and no. Uh, yes, in that y- clearly you are enacting a story, right? So, so you are not being 100% you in that moment. Yeah. Uh, what I would say is the benefit of that for the folks that I serve yeah. a, as a, you could think of this as a gateway drug, the, the narrated classes. Got it. Because it gives people the permission to move their bodies when they never had permission to do it before. Yeah. And they find that, oh my God, my body can actually do this. And I I give a ton of permission on the front end to do any variation that you like. If you don't, if you don't think a pose fits the character and you want to do a different pose, go ahead. So there's all this permission given for them to move their bodies when they maybe have never moved their bodies before and certainly never moved their bodies in front of other people before. Is there in sort of geek nerd communities um, a little bit more body shame or like I sometimes I look at those communities and I see a lot of signs of trauma and, and I see the sort of escape of oneself as an, into fantasy as a way out of trauma and also not in every instance but certainly in some I, I, I guess a bit more than average and also like away from the discomfort of maybe being slightly overweight or being just like um uh, I've seen sort of dyspraxic type people that are just sort of uncomfortable in their bodies. Do you know what I mean in those communities? And again, tell me if this is just pure stereotype. Yeah. So um, I I work from a body positivity perspective, so I don't use terms like overweight, uh, use uh, plus size, larger bodies. Because um, there, if there's an overweight, that means there's a weight <laughs> that we're supposed to be. And I don't sure believe that, there yeah. is. Um, but where I think that body shaming comes from is from the the jocks and the the folks that made fun of the geeks mm. in high school mm. there's a lot of bullying and that stuff gets internalized and especially in our culture uh, there is an idea that there's such a thing as a weight you're supposed to be and that you can be over it and that there's a way you're supposed to look and you can be weird so yes i think that is a prevalent thing in geek culture where people feel shitty about themselves Mm -hmm. but i don't think that authentically comes from within them i think that comes from without yeah and 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 i said like what i've seen in culture is people getting kind of shamed elsewhere and then going well i just want to be in a place that accepts me and what i see in the communities my cousins are part of is they just love that place and 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 everyone accepts them and 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 their friends are really fucking friendly and nice Mm -hmm. Uh, well who wouldn't want to be part of that even if you didn't like comics or harry potter or whatever like 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 that's a great environment Mm -hmm. to be in just because people are more accepting than in a sort of judgy judgy mainstream culture which definitely yoga is a part of now yeah so going back to the mindfulness question Mm. um most of the folks that come find me have either never engaged in a wellness environment before or have tried and been shamed there yeah so Yes, if they're at a narrated class, they are, I would say, embodying the story. Yeah. And 
they actually get to be present even though they're in the story. And uh, what I mean by that is they feel safe. Yeah. They don't feel like, oh, that, I mean, I am a tiny, skinny, blonde lady. Like that is, that is true. Um, but that's about where my presentation that matches the mainstream yoga narrative kind of ends. Yeah. Uh, and so there isn't that feeling of like, oh, that yoga teacher's judging me. Oh, she's looking at me and she's thinking. Yeah, you tell you don't have that vibe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And so, sure, they're embodying the story, but they're able to be present in their bodies while they're being playful and they don't have to worry about somebody coming around and shaming them. Mm -hmm. and that's that's huge anywhere right forget mm -hmm. about the uniforms or the the fun stuff the stories i mean that's that's just a a wonderful thing you know for a teacher to have of any embodied art not to be mm -hmm. kind of shaming people helping people feel comfortable i i kind of also you know wonder what other cultures subcultures are out there that maybe aren't well served and it, it mm -hmm. seems like yoga particularly is doing is coming more and more differentiated it's this like heavy metal yoga and this yoga and that yoga mm -hmm. which in some ways is positive because it, it it's kind of letting more and more people come to yoga uh, and uh, you know I, uh, there's christian yoga in the states you know there's other groups who may feel mm -hmm. excluded from the kind of mainstream yoga culture and I'm, I'm wondering if you can think of any others that kind of aren't necessarily going to be attracted to the regular yoga class uh, well, I mean, geeks are the ones that I committed to serve. So, <laughs> so those, those are my peeps. But I mean, I think there still need to be more safe spaces for queer folks, um, for people of size, for um, people of color. Like there are starting to be more of those safe spaces, but they're not quite as robust as they should be based on how large those populations are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense to me. I mean, in in terms of um, kind of like ethnicity, do you, do you think mm -hmm. there's, you know, do you hear a lot of people say there's real barriers there for people? And the size one makes total sense to me. I've definitely mm -hmm. yoga classes where I thought if I was bigger, I would not feel catered for here. And actually mm -hmm. it might be physically unsafe for me with some of the yeah. stuff being done. Mm -hmm. You know, I've definitely seen that in classes. I've had a, you know, a bigger person next to me and I've thought, fucking hell, that don't look safe. Are you all right? You know, for God's sake, I hope the teacher offers you some variations, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of ethnicity, do you see that as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, you know, I don't know what the what the vibe is in the UK, but mm. here there is. I mean, there are some big disparities between no. um, white folks and people of color, and so just because a yoga studio says, oh yeah, t we're totally safe for you. But they're not making any effort to what, actually... What does that look like? What does it effort so, look like? So when I think of that, I think of the language that is used. Um, what kind of language are we using? Are, and I talk, to, um, I talk to other teachers about this just in how to serve underserved populations. Because even though I teach geeks and some people are like, oh, that's cool and niche like it's actually some it's actually a skill that can translate to other people, right? Yeah, that's what that's what I'm thinking here. Like other under and it seems to me in the States people are obsessed with gender and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. To some extent the kind of homosexuality, kind of queer issues, which is cool, mm -hmm. you know, all yeah. useful things to look at. Though mm -hmm. interestingly, I think in yoga, it's often men who are underserved. So it's a little bit of a role reversal from the normal societal stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in one yoga studio in Brighton and there was just no men in their catalogue in any of the pictures. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, well, how do you expect to encourage blokes to come here yeah. if, if you're not showing any blokes? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, in any... So the, yeah. the, they just hadn't have thought about that. But then mm -hmm. just to finish, there's other groups that I think like working class people or geeks that mm -hmm. I just don't hear anyone having a narrative around because everyone's obsessed with the normal uh, kind, of kind of privilege groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, everybody wants to make money. And I mean, that's the thing with people of color. I mean, you, you look at yoga studios advertising. Do you, do you mm. see folks of color? Do you see folks of size in their advertising? Or do you see an absolute like me um yeah and i which, I'd ask listeners I, just google google yoga magazine or <laughs> yoga journal just mm -hmm. google that now on google image search and literally what you will see is 50 white women mm -hmm. you one maybe plus size type person you'll see one 
one or two guys and probably two or three sort of Asian women. And you'll see, you, that is who you'll see. You'll see a whole bunch of 30-something skinny white women. That, mm-hmm. that, and that's just from a Google image search, but that image search says something, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because what, what is going to make that person that's in the marginalized group, whatever that group is, feel like, oh, this is for me. Mm. Like, mm. N- none of that is going to make you feel like it's for you. And as, when you're going, as you were saying, there are lots of folks in the geek community who've experienced trauma. And anecdotally, I would say that's true. I mean, I would say a mm. lot of the population just in general has experienced mm. trauma. Um, but these folks are finding some quality outlets for dealing with that. Um, But in my psychotherapy practice, I get lots of folks that have seen mainstream traditional therapists before they came to see me. And Mm. therapists say things like, go take a yoga class. And they, and they don't think about what that actually means that that they're sending this person of size, this weirdo. And I say weirdo with all the love in the world because I am a weirdo. into this super traditional fucking space yeah. where they're going to be automatically othered. They're going to be dressed wrong. They're going to act wrong. And yes, you're right. Uh, traditional therapist yoga would be helpful for that person, but you can't just send them to any old big box franchise yoga studio or they'll get more trauma. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. What do you enjoy about it? Like, what's? Well, I mean, it just looks incredibly fun, if nothing mm-hmm. else. Like, what? What do you really enjoy about about this work you do? Oh, so many things. Um, I I enjoy that I get to help people feel at home in their bodies um, for the first time. I enjoy that I get to m- make my career completely revolve around stories. Um, so my Every yoga class I teach has some sort of narrative aspect to it, Mm. whether it's a narrated class or, you know, just a class. Like last night, I just taught a class, but it's it's always some sort of story, some sort of takeaway. You can think of it like uh, for the yoga teachers that are listening, you can think about theming, but I take it about... I turn it up to 11. Yeah, not just the next level, like a whole nother level. And yeah. <laughs> so let's be really explicit here. Like, because mm-hmm. what does that add? Now, just the theming or the narrative doesn't have to be in a geeky way. Mm-mm. Is it just adding a level of meaning and commitment? Is it just making it more accessible? Uh, is it creating this sort of hero's journey, which is kind of archetypally powerful? Mm-hmm. Like, what is, what is the narrative? I mean, aside from that, it's cool and fun. Like, yeah. what, is, what is it adding? Mm-hmm. I would say every one of my classes is a hero's journey. And to be fair, if we broke apart anybody's yoga class, that's probably pretty close to what's happening. I mean, there's a natural arc to a class, right? We're, um, we're leaving the ordinary world yeah. as soon as we step into the studio. Yeah. And maybe there's some resistance. Yeah, and, then, and, stuff. and then you answer the call and you have your you have your helpers and you experience the metaphorical death and then you, you know, then, then that's the end. I mean, this, this is the big problem I have with most yoga is the hero <laughs> ends in the belly of the whale in Shavasana and mm-hmm. the integration back into the normal world, the return, mm-hmm. which I think is the hardest part of the journey, right? That's with, what, with the gift, we return doing, with the yeah, gift. gift is, is, is uh, just not in any way done. Mm-hmm. So you're sort of left in that symbolic death in Shavasana pose. So, 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 so how do you do a return? Like, how do we get this um, juicy stuff from this cool fantasy world, mm. this yep. cool narrative into real life? That's, yep. that's, my, that's my question. Yep. So no matter what kind of class I'm teaching, um, I don't leave people in Shavasana, um, which we, I don't use a ton of Sanskrit just because that doesn't speak to my students, mm. uh, which I was talking about language earlier. I think language is so hugely important and, and not considered like considering the language of your students, speaking the language of your students and the experience of your students. My students aren't helped in any way by learning Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. That is not useful for them in their daily life. It's much more useful to them. If I close practice with live long and prosper, That (laughs) that means more to them. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I mean, so the same thing when I'm working in business. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I yeah. 
business friendly language because they're going to be freaked out by Sanskrit, you know? Right. And it doesn't, it doesn't add anything other than a feeling of otherness for those worker bees. Yeah. It's an know? authority. I think it's a subtle claim to, of authority claiming. Yep. And mm-hmm. Status claiming from the teacher. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. It doesn't actually give anything to the students. I think anatomy can be used that way too. Yeah. It's exclusionary, not inclusionary. So, um, I do use Shavasana, uh, at, the term, although usually I say shavas, because, you know, let's just shorten it up. Um, but I, I always bring people back out. We do a nice, slow coming out, and then I invite them to have a seat in whatever way is comfortable for them. And then I offer them a thought to close, some sort of reflection on the practice. I thank them for coming. I acknowledge how difficult it is for them to to have come to their mat and what a big deal that is and how much I appreciate it and their fellow students appreciate it. And then I close with a thought that is somehow reflective of the practice we just did. Mm -hmm. So if it was a Star Trek practice, I am closing with live long and prosper. If it was a Star Wars class, I'm, I'm closing with may the force be with you. And it is actually May the 4th today. It, I know it is. We're, this is going to be released in a few months because I'm going <laughs> before I go traveling. But for listeners, this was recorded on May the 4th. I wish I'd done that on purpose. Oh, I, I, was, I scheduled this. So. You, you scheduled this on purpose. You know? <laughs> yeah, this is the way to go. And what's interesting, actually, is Star Wars is actually based on Zen and Taoism and Aikido. Like Yoda's based on an Aikido instructor. So it's like, actually, a lot of these Eastern philosophies are in these things. Like Harry Potter has all kinds of Jungian mythological stuff in it, doesn't it? Like most Mm -hmm. of the, like the people that write a lot of this geek culture are actually deeply psychologically informed. Oh, there, there are so many archetypes. And that's, that's what's great for me and my work. You, you asked what I enjoy about my work. I go on, on tangents, um, is that I get to incorporate these archetypes because they fundamentally speak to every human being. And so even if you aren't a star Wars nerd, if you come to class, you can identify that Obi-Wan Kenobi and Yoda are these sage archetypes and, in my therapy practice, I, I talk to clients about that. Like, how, who is the Obi-Wan in your life? Have you, you know, how, how does that person help you on your hero's journey? Let's, let's talk a little bit about the therapy then. So do you also yeah. specialize in geek therapy? Or, yep. or mm-hmm. you do? So, so people are presenting to you with the reg- anxiety, depression, the regular stuff, or, or is there a particular niche within that? Mm -hmm. So the way that I describe my practice, my practice is called blue box counseling and that's a Dr. Who reference, which the, the, the Brits should understand the, the, Um, the the British nonviolent action hero. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And the reason I chose that is because we're all bigger on the inside. I get it. Uh, yeah. I get it. Yeah, Tardis. Uh, no, some people don't. Listeners might not. You're right. Let's be inclusionary. So if you're <laughs> listening to this and you don't like Doctor Who, you're a loser. Please quit. <laughs> immediately. Doctor Who is where it's at. He's a role model. It's fun. Okay. So Blue Box Counseling. Got it. Yep. Doctor Who reference. Now I get it. Yep. And um, what I say about my practice is that I serve anybody that's considered themselves outside the mainstream. So geeks, nerds, punks, LGBTQIA folks, um, secular folks, people that have experienced religious trauma, um, people that have felt unheard in traditional counseling. And, and I see a lot of geeks. And your picture on the website, well, I'll link this, so is, is you in the Game of Thrones uh, <laughs> Throne. Definitely, my wife and I used to watch Game of Thrones, and we were separated because of visa issues. We'd always watch Game of Thrones, and then and then talk about it, and then usually some like deep couple counselling issue would come up about which person killed who or raped who or whatever in the in the mm. episode that would always come up. So uh, Game of Thrones will add that to our Star Wars, Star Trek, Doctor Who environment, and mm. so people feel excluded. So there's often issues of belonging. Um, trauma issues perhaps and, and you're doing mm-hmm. kind of mainstream sort of talk therapy with them analytic therapy what's the main methodology uh, the my main modality is narrative therapy narrative which therapy. would surprise no one um, but if if you're not familiar with narrative therapy basically what it does is it externalizes the problem 
So let's say I see a lot of folks with anxiety yeah. uh, and, and depression and trauma. Um, but the anxiety folks, let's say somebody comes in, they're telling me about their anxiety. Instead of saying, okay, well, let's, let's assess the thought that you had before you, you know, did this behavior. And well, I would say something like, man, it seems like there's just little anxiety gremlins crawling all over you. Uh-huh. you those little anxiety gremlins. And then we talk about how can we put those anxiety gremlins back in, you know, gizmo's basket. Yeah, I, there were some friends of mine in Russia are quite into narrative therapy. There's a whole bunch of my students there who are mm-hmm. trained in narrative therapy. So I've just started kind of hearing about it. Mm-hmm. I'm curious about it. I remember one time I saw a doctor take a child and, and the child was nervous about this. I was in a hospital. The child was nervous about this operation. And he got a teddy bear and said, Teddy's nervous about this operation. What would you tell Teddy? And just immediately like externalize the nerves of the child. Yep. And the child sort of talked through the teddy, what he would say, would say to the teddy, but was actually talking to himself, right? This mm-hmm. is like five-year-old. And I just thought that was a brilliant move by the doctor because I was like, wow, I see what you did there. Um, yeah. Okay, so narrative therapy. Give me another mm-hmm. example of that because I'm wanting to learn a bit more about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so the externalizing is one of the big bits that I use. Um, there's also this idea of identifying the narratives that you believe about yourself and Mm. your world. So bringing it back to body stuff, um, let's say that one of the narratives you believe to be true is that um, people in larger bodies aren't allowed to exercise in public. Mm -hmm. Let's let's say that's a narrative that you hold for yourself. Um, So we would explore that and, and kind of deconstruct that narrative, take a big step back and look at, well, how much of this is authentically coming from you? How much of this is coming from the outside world, like media or other people or bullying that happened when you were a kid? And if we really look at it and deconstruct it, does that story serve you? Well, of course not. And is that story actually harming you? Fuck yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, go on. No, well, can, can we go ahead and start writing a new narrative that more accurately serves you in your life because these narratives are actually really malleable. We just, we consider them to be static and they're not. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've seen, you know, there's a coaching school that use kind of helping people change their narratives and then according to their subculture. So Mm -hmm. you're using sort of geek subculture. I saw one that was working with a martial artist and it was like, okay, you used to be this, now you're white crane. And that's a style of martial arts that the guy really Mm -hmm. relates to. And Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all, narratives are embodied if someone thinks they have the world on their shoulders that's their narrative that's also a body right yeah if if someone has a narrative they're a victim or they're whatever that there's an embodiment to that so Mm -hmm. you know my students in russia are combining a lot of body stuff with narrative work because they just say well there's always a body aspect to the narrative and you can play with that Mm -hmm. yeah okay cool so we're nearly on time any other interesting body aspects to what you do that you think people might uh, be interested to hear about? Uh, so something that I do that's pretty unique is I mentioned that I go to conventions. And when I'm talking about conventions, I'm talking about comic cons. Yeah. Uh, I go to comic cons all over the U.S. and I teach yoga. Um, people come and take class in their cosplay, in their, you know, costumes. Um they just they show up as they are and they move their body in whatever way they feel comfortable doing that and i feel like that's something that's really unique to what i do because you know if you if you just threw down a mat somewhere people aren't necessarily going to feel safe to just show up however mm. they are um and and these folks do and they are able to listen to what their bodies need and want. I mean, if somebody's wearing a corset, they're, they're not going to try and do a forward fold. Like they can, they can acknowledge that. And I think there's, um, I don't know, there's just some permission and safety in what I do. And I, I love being able to bring that to where my population is. Yeah. The, the other thing I just want to point out for listeners is this is mm-hmm. a great example. One of the best I've ever seen of niching and branding mm-hmm. So I'm just going to point out to listeners, this is someone who's taking something really authentic from the heart that they clearly believe in. I don't mind me talking about you in front of the listeners. That's okay. 
<laughs> let's take something they really believe in that's from the heart and they've branded around it and like their website which i'll share and all the other things are completely consistent with that and it looks like they're going to be getting less clients but i'm guaranteeing this person will be more successful than a yoga teacher who tries to work with everyone so mm-hmm. for, for those of you who are interested in the sort of business of uh, volume and stuff this is a great case study uh, I was teaching business to embodiment people yesterday and it just struck me this is a, a perfect example if you don't mind me using it I'd love to sort of show it to people oh please do good so you can be you can make money you can help people you can have fun that's the dream right it is the dream that is the dream okay well I'm glad you're living it uh, in terms of finding more I'm gonna I'm gonna link to blueboxcounseling.com Mm-hmm. Where else should I be be linking to Yoga International? I'm going to do one of those classes. Yes, sure, because you can do those online, right? They're online classes. Mm-hmm. Yep, um, you can find links to all of my stuff on the website. Um, if you prefer to do social, the social media thing, you can find me at Mind Body Fandom on the major social media sites. That's because I take a holistic approach to healing, mind, body, and fandom. And I will be launching my own podcast soon that's focused on therapy called Starship Therapize. That sounds cool. Starship <laughs> Therapize. Um, uh, I, I think therapy also needs this not taking itself so seriously. One of the, when I was interviewing therapists to find myself a new therapist, one of my questions was, tell me a joke. And the vast majority of therapists I interviewed for the job couldn't tell me a joke and I just thought that's really sad (laughs) like you must know a joke anyway so a final message about the body Justine for our listeners Mm -hmm. my final message would be I invite you to live in the body that you have right now and appreciate it for what it can do and what it does do and maybe start to challenge the narrative that you need to look or be any particular way in order to be worth it. You're worth it right now. Justin, thank you so much. Live long and prosper. May the force be with you. Oh, thank you so much. Nerd must stay. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to get more. If you'd like to help us build the Embodied Tribe, leave a review on iTunes or share this on your social media. If you're interested in training globally, sign up to receive the newsletter at embodiedfacilitator.com. Until next time, welcome home to the body.